They can take away the books, they can take away all the equipment, the computers, everything. But the knowledge is in the head, is in the brain. The government can crush our bodies, but they cannot crush the mind and soul. It's really quite shocking to find an entire community of hundreds of thousands of people to be so systematically excluded from right to education. It is very clear to me that the Baha'i population of Iran is an endangered species. On the 21st of May 2011, all across Iran, there was a simultaneous raid in homes in the wee hours of the morning. Iranian authorities, plains clothes men, uniformed police barged into homes across the country and started seizing equipment, questioning people. They eventually took dozens of individuals, men, women, youth, in for questioning. So it was a planned attack on the Baha'i Institute of Higher Education. It's really important for the Iranian government to live up to its commitment to uphold justice for all people in the country and to live up to the Islamic values by which it uh, claims to stand. Good afternoon, everybody. We are going to talk about the freedom of education globally in the context of the situation that's been developing over the past 30 years in Iran regarding uh, the Baha'i students that are being denied uh, higher education in that country. It was 40 homes of individuals that were linked somehow to the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education. So it was either students or teachers or administrators. And there were dozens of individuals that were taken into custody and interrogated. And some of them remain in uh, uh, detention even today. And solely because they were teaching or uh, learning or administering uh, at the Baha'i Institute of Higher Education. Education is one of the most fundamental civil rights of, of any human being within any republic. What the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education has done in Iran is nothing uh, uh, short of uh, of a miracle. Yeah, my father was one of the founders uh, for the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education. The Baha'i faith started about uh, 160 years ago in, in Iran. And the, the persecution of the Baha'is basically started with the inception of the faith. Tens of thousands of Baha'is were killed at, at the time. To date, about 300,000 Baha'is live in Iran. Baha'is believe in the importance of education, the equality of men and women, in the equality of all people, and that ultimately mankind will live in harmony. I was born in Tehran, Iran. Being a Baha'i, we had our own challenges growing up. We couldn't have the social life that other kids had. And we were always growing up with the fear that one day they may kick us out of school. So I knew my options are very limited. And at any time, I might be stopped from growing or from going further. My mom was expelled from her job. And my brother was not allowed to continue his education in the, in the university. Um, same for me, same for my sister, for my uncle, for my aunt. The Iranian government um, is actually hurting the Iranian culture and Iranian uh, country, the whole country, not just the Baha'i community. A lot of other minorities, a lot of smart people, graduates from universities, they're not allowed. They do not find opportunities in Iran. When I was in first grade, one of my best friend's father got executed only because he was a Baha'i. Uh, and uh, so it was for a child who couldn't comprehend it 
it was a scary years for us. Uh, you know, we didn't know what is going to happen. During uh, the Shah, there was persecution of Baha'is, but it was uh, limited. After the revolution, it became the hidden agenda of the government to deprive Baha'is from any cultural or economical progress. They expelled all the Baha'i professors from universities, and Baha'i students could not finish their educations. Baha'is were not allowed to work for government, state-related jobs. Baha'is uh, lost some of their properties and were arrested. And there were more than 200 Baha'is which were executed in the 1980s. My own personal story is that my father was um, a psychiatrist and he was just an extraordinary person. He became member of the National Spiritual Assembly of Baha'is in Iran in 1980. They were abducted by the government and after that moment nobody knows what happened to them. There is no sign, no news, nothing. They were just abducted and that's it. The assumption is that they were executed, but when and how, nobody knows. My father was a member of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of Iran. And in 1981, he was arrested and in a very short span of time, he was executed along with seven other of his colleagues. So yes, it was very cruel and it was heartbreaking. But at the same time, I really see the root cause of it as ignorance. My father was in jail for three, three months and my mother was there something like close to three, three years. My mother, they took her to the firing squad uh, 10 times in a row and they told her, if you say that I'm not a Baha'i, we will release you. If you're a Baha'i, we might kill you. And each time they didn't fire and they did that 10 times. So that's like dying 10 times. But I remember one time that they gave us the last visit, which they were supposed to kill my mother the next time. She gave me her ring, her wedding ring, and told me that uh, um, give this ring to my uh, to your wife because I might not be around to give him that. So that was the moment that I actually kind of uh, thought, okay, they might kill her. I'm really proud of being a Baha'i. I cherish it, and uh, um, we had to sacrifice. The government policy has been very much thought out and uh, implemented in a systematic and pre-planned way to keep the Baha'is under control. All of those things were spelled out in a secret document that was leaked in the mid-90s from the Supreme Leader's office. So uh, this is a letter written to the supreme uh, leader of the uh, uh, Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, stated uh, 25 February 1991. The recent views and directives given by the esteemed leader regarding the Baha'i question were conveyed to the Supreme Council. The government's dealing with them must be in such a way that their progress and development are blocked. They must be expelled from universities, either in the admission process or during the course of their studies, once it becomes known that they are Baha'is. Deny them employment if they identify themselves as Baha'is. Deny them any position of influence, 
such as in the education sector, etc. The letter is signed by Dr. Sayyid Mohammad Gulpaigani, the Secretary of the Supreme Revolutionary Cultural Council. I was not a Baha'i, but I went to school with several Baha'i and other minorities in Iran. The earliest memory I have of discrimination against them is the fact that they could not drink water from the same water fountains that the rest of the children, the Muslim children, could drink from. I remember when after playing a soccer game, they all had to gather, line up behind one fountain when everybody else is drinking from all the other fountains. So I walk over there to drink with them because one of my close friends was a Baha'i and everybody and said, no, no, stop, don't drink from that fountain. When I went home, I asked my mother about this and she started laughing and said, oh, people are uneducated and stupid and they don't understand. You drink from whatever fountain you want. I've served in East Timor and Chechnya during the war, and I have seen horrible crimes committed against minorities. But what is striking about human rights violations that are being committed against the Iranian Baha'i community is that this is a community that is at peace with the state. This is a community that only asks to be able to practice its faith. Well, Baha'is in Iran love their country, and they want to serve their country. They want to be good citizens. They are good citizens. Baha'is are not recognized in the Iranian constitution. And they have no legal rights whatsoever. Amnesty International has been increasingly concerned about persecution of the Baha'is because the Iranian government has been increasingly persecuting Baha'is as well as other minorities. If you deny people the right to higher education, you, there are so many other aspects of their life that are affected. I was born in uh, Sariz, in the north part of Iran, south side of the Caspian Sea. My father was working for natural resources of the state and my mother was working as an agricultural consultant. And recently she became a student at the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education. After the revolution, they both were fired because they were Baha'is. I remember the first year of uh, elementary school, my father was not around because uh, most of the members of the local spiritual assembly of that city were arrested and he felt that they would come after him sooner or later. I was seven years old and I remember some nights going to bed crying. In 2007, my father was interrogated and put in solidarity for a long time. And in 2008, eventually, he uh, was in jail for about a year because of his uh, Baha'i beliefs. And it's still, actually, again, they called upon him very recently. And now he has uh, five or eight months of prison. Now that I'm in the United States, I, uh, I talk with my parents very frequently. I'm worried about them. You should turn on and off modem one more time. Did you do that? Yes, I did. Sedai Mahkube, can you hear me now? Did you hear about Dad's appeal? Did you guys hear back about it? He's talking to his lawyer. They are writing lawyer here for the court. Appeal, okay. So it's five months plus, plus $300 as of now. The situation is, is always changing. <laughs> I'm really proud of my parents. You know, they're truly remarkable people. So um, love you both, you know. Uh, take care of yourself and uh, hopefully we see each other uh, sometime soon. Have a nice day and night. Sure, Bye. sure. Good office. What we have had is a systematic harassment, it's not uh, accidental. I'm not a Baha'i myself. In fact, I was born to a very devout Shi'i mother, but our neighborhood included Baha'is. And uh, one of these neighbors was very close and very dear to us. And one of the most traumatic experiences of my childhood is 
uh, when there was a demonstration in front of his house harassing him because he was a Baha'i. This violence was something that stayed with me. It is very important not to segregate Baha'is from the rest of the society. Yeah, I was born and grew up in Tehran. My father and my mother, they did extraordinary struggle to make sure I get all the tools that I need to fight my battles in the life. I was at high school with very good GPA. I was with this group of my friends that they were all Muslims but me, and they were getting to these schools, and I couldn't, just because I was Baha'i. This is the application for just regular school. And you can see that it has, it has a column for religion. This, this is the column the row that you need to say, what is your religion? And it has Islam, Christianity, Jews, Rastarian. They required the admissions form filled by students to declare their religion. And if you're a Baha'i, they immediately would find out and not let you enroll. I love education. I wanted to continue my education. My friend used to tell me, just check the, check, check the Muslim box and you can go to college. But I wasn't willing to do that. The only option was open for me was BIHE. When the university started, it was us as students, mainly at home, trying to communicate with our professors. Baha'i Institute for Higher Education, or BIHE for short, started in 1987. I was born in Kermanshah, and education was always very important in my family. Did you tell your teacher that you're, you cannot do PE? Okay. I always love to teach. Are you ready for exam? Did you study enough? I remember that first meeting when we started BIHE. They said, okay, this is the opportunity for you to teach and for the youth to learn. But there is <laughs> some uh, <laughs> fact here that there is no money, there is no uh, credit, there is no, uh, there are a lot of hard work, and uh, of course there is some danger. Our instructors were the most sincere, dedicated people I've ever seen. It was less than 100 students when we started BIHE. But by the time I left Iran and the first group has been graduated, it was about 3,000 students. It was very dangerous because all the phones were tapped, all the mails were checked. So they had to do everything face to face, hand to hand. It was done all based on correspondence. Even at the very simplest steps, it's almost impossible. Just mailing our assignments to the instructors, we came to the point that we had to use our own career system. We had to put everything in a packet, giving it to somebody local, they put it in his car and drive to another city. There were drivers that they would dedicate their time as a service, not getting paid to drive around and take these assignments and booklets from the instructor and get it back to you. So it takes like two months for one assignment to go to the instructor and come back and you see, oh, I did this thing wrong. Classes were held at uh, houses of Baha'is of Tehran or sometimes at their private businesses. So we had a little different experience than those kids that get driven to uh, uh, schools by their parents. Every three weeks, I have to jump into a bus and uh, go maybe about six hours drive to uh, Tehran. I didn't have very uh, close relatives in Tehran, so I had to find other Baha'i students to stay with. We had kids from all around the country coming to our house for classes and for labs. Some of them stayed with us. We would usually serve them some uh, breakfast. They would go down to, to do the lab, come upstairs for, uh, for lunch, and then go, go, go down to the basement for some more uh, testing and demonstrations.
we called them a marathon of classes because it was just one continuous thing, eight o'clock in the morning up to seven o'clock in the afternoon for three days. And sometimes we didn't have enough chairs to seat everybody because the apartments are pretty small and we were about sometimes 20, 30 students. So we had to go to the neighbor's house, knock on the door and ask for chairs to sit in our classroom. Originally there were two majors, uh, sciences and uh, math. And then within each of these two majors, sub-majors started to, to, to develop. As time went by, the number of different courses also was growing. We designed the music department and it was the most rewarding thing. People came with different instruments. Some, some of them were playing the piano, some of them were singers, some of them were playing Persian instruments like Santur, Tar, or Sitar. It is so amazing. It's so um, unheard of to, to be able to be a part of this institution. And it amazingly worked actually, because even in that situation, everybody would collaborate with each other to get the work done, uh, which is what I liked. We were all there for the same reason, to learn. Later on, things changed and there was a building. Many things progressed in so many ways. It was a big family and everybody assisted everybody else. We had more classes with our professors, so we could communicate better. That definitely helped a lot. We had a small library that we could actually go and do some research as well, which was something we could not do before. We go there, we see all different faces from different places in Iran, from very south Iran to the north Iran, east and west. It's one of the most remarkable educational experiences in the world. At first, we were very cautious to share this activity with the other non-Baha'i friends. But after a while, we started to even uh, ask some Muslim friends to teach in BIHE. And they have been great. They were well aware that it might be dangerous for them, but they accepted. Yeah, there are a lot of, you know, uh, Iranian Muslim, that they are very helpful, very understanding. Muslim friends of us, that they were always for us, they always supported us. And we looked at them like our brothers. A dear Muslim friend of mine, he used a lot to help me when he heard I had problems with one of my most difficult engineering courses. He could have been expelled from his university in Tehran, or even worse if he was caught. I remember we had to be very careful not to attract so much attention. And sometimes, you know, when the class was over, they were telling us to leave you know, like two people every five minutes. It was always this chance of getting arrested or getting questioned and getting, you know, detained for what you're doing. Not only administering BIHE, but also teaching, being a student, copying papers, or even delivering the documents. Um, I was at the school at a time doing my pharmaceutical research. And then all of a sudden, I heard a shatter door all of a sudden opened to the building and a few men came to the facility. And then I remember that all of us were sad, thinking that this is fearful, this, this, is, this is frightening. They had guns. They came in, they confiscated all the books, materials and, and computers, and uh, they arrested the person that was in charge and they uh, put a lock on there so nobody can go back. One by one, we were interviewed about uh, 
what is it that you're doing. Um, for myself, for example, they, they were asking me about the names and telephone numbers of my professors, um, trying, I think, to catch them, which of course I did not reveal. My uncle's whatever he had was confiscated and he was put in prison. Then when he came out, the building was not there anymore and they had to begin from the point zero one more time. Uh, we had to rent a new building, a new class, and uh, take all the facilities there, all the computers and boards to a new place and start courses to, in a new place. And recently, uh, in May 2011, they had a second major attack on the institute and arrested uh, several members of the uh, faculty and administration. And uh, my heart is really with them. My physics professor, um, made a huge impact on me. He was, uh, he's in jail right now. My uncle was arrested. He is in prison right now. Mehavash Sabet, who is one of the seven Yaran currently imprisoned in Rajai Shah prison, was, uh, was one of the directors of the Baha'i Institute of Higher Education. And she has been sentenced to 20 years in prison. They are people who have been arrested who I know very closely. I cannot say their names. They've been my classmates, and they've been my teachers, great teachers of me. And um, they are in prison, and their families haven't heard from them. And their only charge is education. BIH's story just does not end in Iran. Now, can you, can you count the socks? How many socks do you Manya and I got married while we were both students at the BIHE. Uh -oh. After a couple of years, though, we had to leave the country. We came to United States and have had a lot of great opportunities, but also some struggles. Like many BIHE graduates, we found it hard getting our credits accepted by American schools. The American academic institutions should open their eyes and their hearts as well as their doors to these students. They are some of the best and brightest students that have come out of Middle East. Now I'm an online teacher um, and I'm working with the Baha'i students uh, who are still in Iran. I don't get to see the faces, but I get to hear their voices. They ask very good questions and it's very, very interactive. It has been over two decades now that the university has been going in spite of all the problems. I strongly believe that BIHE will continue to evolve even more and the government will not be able to shut it down. If you want civil liberties for 72 million Iranians, begin with the building block of the Baha'is. At the heart and the core of the society remains a tolerant, and a multifaceted, multicultural society that is perfectly capable of living in peace and harmony and acceptance and, and learning from each other. Many people think that the Iranian government just doesn't care what the world thinks of them, but that's absolutely not true. The Iranian government is very sensitive to international pressure. It's very conscious of its public image around the world. And so that's why it's very important for human rights activists to take action. Uh, educational institutions abroad uh, have a moral responsibility uh, to address this entire generation of Iranians, whether they are dissidents and activists who are uh, deprived of higher education or Baha'is who because of their faith and beliefs are being deprived. Everywhere in the world, those uh, whose rights are being violated, uh, those who uh, cannot practice their faith, those who cannot express uh, their political beliefs or have their cultural practices can learn from Baha'i community. I hope that we can use this experience and similar experiences to not only just think about ourselves and what is important to us, but to look at the bigger picture, to think of people of this world as they were our own family. The Baha'i institution of higher education shows everyone that we can stand for whatever we want, we can 
nobody can ban me from being a human being. Nobody can ban me from learning.